Good evening all and welcome. Today we're going to be heading into the deep woods for a collection of truly disturbing stories. I hope you're ready, because it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I grew up in Southern California. One thing about that part of the state you often hear is that you can go surfing and skiing on the same day. But assuming the traffic was light, you could pull it off. I grew up in the Inland Empire, which is about 60 to 90 miles east of LA. We lived near the foothills of the San Bernardino Mountains. My father is a mountain man. I can't overstate enough that he is truly in his element when he is lost in the mountains. He has spent his entire life exploring the local mountains and he knows every back road, service road, trail, and has even had a specialized bump key that he can use to unlock forest service road blocks. I'm gonna tell you two stories involving my dad and I in the mountains, where some weird stuff went down. The first story happened when I was in Boy Scouts. Because my dad was one, he wanted me to have those wilderness experiences and become capable out there. And I'm grateful for that, as I had a great time in the scouts and even though I'm a big city boy, I'm confident that I can go toe to toe with my dad in a wilderness survival contest. We were at the San Bernardino Mountains on a camp out one time and our camp was pretty deep in the woods. We hiked from 6 a.m. till sunset to get to our campsite. Granted, this is a group of scouts of varying ages and abilities in the mountains, so take that into account. My dad and I set up our tent pretty far from the rest of the group, at least 50 meters from the central campfire. We always did this because the younger boys would be up all night making noise, and we liked to sleep after a day of mountaineering. We had just gotten into our mummy bags and finally got comfy when we started to hear rock clicking on the ridge above us, about another 50 to 100 meters up from the valley. My dad is a big time Sasquatch believer and I certainly believe there are things in the wilderness that humans cannot comprehend. And there is plenty of wilderness in the United States for anything to hide for as long as it wants. My dad gets on the radio to another scout leader then asks for them to do a head count of the boys, and if any of the adults had gone off into the woods. Everyone was accounted for. This wasn't a particularly popular trail, so it's unlikely anyone else was in the area besides us. So we get quiet and just listen. We noticed that there were no animal slash insect noises in the area at this time. We were just lying there in our tent, listening intently. I was trying to listen over the sound of my heart beating out of my chest. It was so quiet that I could hear the blood pulsating in my brain. More rock clicking. And these weren't little rocks. They sounded like significantly large rocks, too heavy for a human of average strength to hold in each hand and bang together that hard. My heart was racing at this point. I'm not so much scared as I am excited. My dad and I spent a lot of time in the mountains when I was a kid, so I was quite familiar with all kinds of animal noises and things that go bump in the night. I believed my dad when he told me that Sasquatch aren't violent creatures, but it was territorial and would let you know when you crossed a boundary. Rock clicking and throwing are one of those signals. We heard rocks being flung off the ridge and crashing down in the valley below about 30 to 50 meters downhill drop. Though not a sheer drop, there had to be some serious strength to throw these rocks that far. It sounded like they were being thrown. Then it got quiet. It was quiet for long enough that we figured old Biggie was done and had gone off to bed. All of a sudden, we hear a whole last tree being ripped out of the ground. Keep in mind it's about 75 meters away and probably 30 meters above our elevation. This valley had a solid echo to it, but I kid you not, I could hear the roots of this tree being ripped up from the ground. Now I was getting scared. It's one thing to throw rocks at intruders like us, and it's another to rip a damn tree out of the ground. But that was it. 
After that, we were left with nothing but silence, and none of the group heard a peep for the rest of the night. The next day, we all hiked up to the ridge and checked out the area. We found large rocks that had been cracked open, and we found a spot where we think a tree may have been pulled out, but no tree nearby. We found some thick hair caught in the bark of a few trees, and it smelled like garbage sitting in a hot metal trash can in the summer. The ground was too firm for any definitive footprints to be found, but there were a lot of branches on the ground broken off surrounding trees up until about eight feet. My dad and I and a few other leaders decided we had disturbed the peace enough, and we packed up the camp and moved on. There were no further incidents during this trip, and we never told the other scouts. This second story happened on the other side of San Bernardino Peak. My dad and I were hiking up to the summit, where he had spread his father's ashes back in 1987, and just a few months after I was born. We had tried multiple times to get to the summit, but my dad was in his 40s at the time, and had high blood pressure, which always made him too weak to be about 8,500 feet. Anyway, he was on a new medication now, and was determined to summit the peak, and have a little spiritual moment with me, where his dad was laid to rest. My grandfather was a serious badass World War II veteran, who was a B-17 flying fortress mechanic in England. But he would regularly fly missions as a gunner when they were short on men, and would also fly in gliders by night into France to repair salvageable bombers that had been downed during bombing runs. So needless to say, his legacy was important to us, as we were going to get to the top of that damn mountain this time. It was a particularly hot day, and when you're above the clouds and smog, the air is cooler, but the sun is more oppressive. It can lull inexperienced hikers into a sense of safety. We weren't well prepared for this hike, as we had underestimated the exposure factor that day. We only bought two large water bottles because we wanted to be as light as possible. Well, about three quarters of the way up the mountain, we ran out of water. It was kind of a decision point. We either bust our asses up the mountain and get down quick, or we call it quits. My dad suddenly remembers a mountain spring not far from us, and suggests we hustle down there and fill our bottles. We had water purifying tablets, so we weren't worried about parasites often found in spring water that causes unpleasant plumbing problems. So we jaunt down to the spring, only to find that it had dried up. Now we were in a real pickle. We had to trek back down at least 1,000 feet to get back to the trail, and we were seriously parched at this point. So with no other alternative, we hike back up to the trail. At this point, I'm literally sucking the sweat off my shirt to get my tongue wet. We didn't see any other cars in the trailhead parking lot, so had run into no other hikers. As far as we knew, we were totally alone on the mountain that day. So we're standing there panting and trying to figure out what to do, when along comes a man down the trail from the direction of the summit. It almost looked like he was floating. He was so gently trotting down the trail towards us. He was an older, grey-haired and short grey-bearded man with hiking poles and a blue bandana wrapped round his head. He stood in front of us and said, Lovely day, isn't it, fellas? It was around 10am, and we'd been hiking for around four hours already. So it was odd that this guy was already on his way down. My dad asks, Did you sleep up there the night before, or are you the fastest hiker alive? With a chuckle. My dad always had a way of keeping his cool in a bad situation, and he just wanted to be friendly with the guy in the hopes he may give us some water. Oh no, I've seen what I've come here to see, and I'll be off shortly, the man said. I remember that exact quote because it seemed so odd for him to say. He continued on to say, You boys look pretty thirsty. You ran out of water? The mountain can be quite deceiving on a hot day like this, right? My dad replied, Funny you should mention that. We did run out of water. Before my dad can continue, the man interjected. And you both went down to that spring over yonder and found it dry, no? 
pointing towards it. We both nodded our heads, dumbfounded. The spring was very well hidden. My dad said to me before that probably no one alive today besides him knows about the spring. The man continued. Well, I've got about a gallon of water here in my pack, probably not enough for you to summit today, but enough to get you hydrated and down the mountain. He produced a gallon jug of water and said, Drink it in good health. And come prepared next time, okay? I don't reckon I'll always be around to save your asses. We took the water and thanked him profusely. And with a grin on his face, he continued trotting down the trail like it was nothing. This was a pretty difficult trail zone and had a lot of rocks and uneven paths. But I distinctly remember this old man just breezing through it like he was just floating. We drank a few good sips, filled our bottles and headed back. Around the bend there was a long series of switchbacks, and this was above the tree line, so there wasn't really anything to obstruct our view, the whole way down this section of trail. But when we rounded the bend and looked down, the man was gone. There's no way he could have descended these switchbacks that fast, even if he was floating along the path. My dad and I looked at each other, and without a word started down the trail back to the car. To this day we are convinced that the man was an angel sent to save our asses. We eventually made it to the summit on another trip, well prepared this time, and we had a ceremony honouring the memory of my grandfather. And we also gave thanks for the angel that had seen what he came to see that one day. Two thirsty men who needed a drink and a lesson. I am a female and the youngest of a large Hispanic family. My father had a lifetime of adventures and interesting stories, one of which used to give me nightmares when I was a child. This happened back in the early 70s. My father had a rough life and a devastating upbringing. He was short in stature as he was of Japanese descent. He was also aggressive and fearless. He had a don't mess with me kind of attitude. My father was an outdoorsman and he was always armed. He would also indulge in liquid courage, more often than he cared to admit, you get the picture. This particular night took place in Sierra Madre which is located in the wooded mountains in Mexico where we lived. It was a typical night. My father was horseback riding home, which would take about two hours. In his drunken stupor, he heard someone calling his name from the woods. Tranquil. Hey, tranquil. It was a raspy voice he didn't recognize, and although it was too dark for him to see, he wasn't concerned. He replied by shouting back angrily. Who are you? How do you know my name? But he kept on riding. The voice persisted. Tranquil. Hey, tranquil. At this point, the unnerving voice put him on edge. Suddenly, the horse got spooked. Father was bucked off by his horse, who took off galloping into the darkness. Unfortunately, his foot got stuck on the saddle, but the horse continued to ride, dragging him face down. After what felt like forever, his foot became dislodged from the saddle, but his horse did not stop. Catching his breath, he stumbled to his feet, hoping for a swig of tequila, promising himself it would be his last drink. He continued to hear someone calling his name in a sadistic, taunting squeak. Father began to shake involuntarily and felt his heart pounding against his rib cage. Fight like a man. Show your face, he muttered, trembling, not truly meaning what he said. He'd been hoping it was just a bad dream since no one had answered. Abruptly, he felt its hot breath. Before he could do or see anything, he was picked up and tossed a few yards into the air. Whoever, or whatever that was, had massive strength and knew his name. And that made him question himself. Obviously, it was too much for him to handle. Father felt defeated. He knew of his impending doom. Whatever it was, it couldn't be human. Barely conscious, his terror intensified when he heard a horrific high-pitched howl. My father was beyond terrified and admitted to almost wetting himself. 
If you help me through this, I promise I will stop drinking. He prayed, in an attempt to bargain with God, but he was barely conscious at this point. His vision went dark, and he collapsed. Waking up, he found himself in a canyon. He was relieved to know he was still alive, but he slowly realized it had not been a dream. He saw his flesh was exposed to the cold wind, and the intensity of the pain throughout his body was excruciating. It was almost dawn, but it was winter, and snowflakes were starting to fall. Moments passed when he started hearing noises nearby. He began to panic. The injured man stumbled to his feet, gathering his bearings, and, without looking back, climbed out of the canyon. Once again, he started making his way home as fast as he could. He knew instantly, recognizing this feeling, that he had been followed. Not just being followed, but being tracked at a great speed. Father was able to feel and hear the creature's noisy breath, only inches behind him. He was petrified but kept moving. Even if he wanted to run, he was too wounded. He almost fainted when he would after that. And he kept good to his word. He quit the liquid courage for good after that. When my father was in his twenties, he liked to frequent a remote hiking trail that was about a 30 minute drive from his house. This trail was situated on the outskirts of his town and was a popular beauty spot. Although it was a huge tourist attraction at the weekend, it could be extremely quiet during the week. Now this was in the 1960s, when stranger danger wasn't prevalent and he never considered the dangers of being alone in such a remote place. However, this was all about to change in September of 1968, when he took his last ever solo trip to the trail. He had been frequenting it for about three months at this point, with little to no incidents. He had done the same routine where he would park up at 5.30 and continue east to take the larger part of the trail, which then looped around and brought him back to the car park at 7.30. This was the summer and evenings were relatively light until about 8 p.m. My father was particularly strict with his timekeeping because there was little light on the trails, plus the change in temperature hugely decreased at dusk. He was always afraid he would lose his footing or be unable to find his way back to the car, so he always ensured he came back before dark. This particular evening, he had arrived later at around 6 p.m., and was surprised to see a tired looking camper van already in the parking lot. Normally you get a couple of cars that he'd become familiar with, but he had never seen this vehicle before, and something about it just gave him the jitters, but he initially put it down as just never seeing it before. He ignored any red flags that popped up, but decided to take a quicker route to ensure he would be back before dark. He consequently decided to take the trail north, which would save him about 30 minutes. Halfway into his hike, he starts to get the sensation he's being followed. He turns back and expects to see another hiker, but the footpath behind him is empty. He looks around to see if there are any animals or a ranger in view, but he can't see anything. Putting it down to paranoia after seeing the van, he continues, but tries to tune into his environment as best he can, listening for any sound or movement. Deeper into the trail, he becomes more and more uncomfortable and realizes that he is totally alone. He hasn't seen another hiker and the feeling of being watched hasn't left him. He knows he has another 30 minutes of walking, so turning back wouldn't make any sense. He continues but quickens his pace and tries to rationalize why he's feeling like this, but it's no good, as he still feels like a deer in headlights. As he approaches a bend in the trail, he immediately gets into the fight or flight feeling, when he senses he's in immediate danger. He half expects to see someone as he turns the bend, 
but no one's there. Still absolutely terrified, he decides he needs to hide from whatever or whoever might be out there, so he hides behind some bushes and tries to remain as quiet as possible. A few minutes go by, and nothing. Not a sound, and he starts to convince himself that it is probably safe to continue. He is about to come out of his hiding spot when he can hear shuffling sounds. It's very light, but coming from the direction he came from. He's hoping that it turns out to be a deer or another forest creature, so that he can laugh about it, and that he's been afraid of nothing. But he sees the outline of a person. He can only partially see them due to his obstructed view, but senses this is a man with a very broad frame. He's walking slowly and carefully past the bushes, as if he doesn't want to be seen. My father then comes to the realization that it is probably who had been following him, and what set off his warning messages to hide. He quickly ponders what he needs to do. He can't go back in the opposite direction, and it's a good hour of walking and nightfall is approaching. He also doesn't want to continue the remainder of the trail, because he may meet whoever was following him. He considers the possibility of hiding for a bit longer, but that would mean being stuck on the trail in the pitch darkness. Then he realizes where he is. He is about a 10 minute run up to the main road that is situated behind the wooded area where he resides. All he has to do is get to the road, and it's probably another 10 minutes to his car. But it's 10 minutes of being in the open. He may just get away with it. So he waits until he suspects the man is out of view and makes a run for it. Two minutes into his running, he starts to hear the branches snapping to his right. It's the man from before. He's now pursuing him through the trees. My father manages to outrun the man and makes it safely onto the road and pauses for a second to catch his breath and then jogs back to the car park, too afraid to look back. On safe arrival to the car, he notices the camper van is still there, but the other cars have since left, leaving him alone. He quickly gets to his car and drives out as fast as he can. As he's pulling out of the road, he looks towards where he had just come from, and the man is just standing in the road. He's staring wide-eyed at my father, with no expression, no movement, just stood there staring. My father drives in the opposite direction, and can see the man just stood in the road still watching his car as he pulls out of view. My father still has no idea if the man actually meant any harm, but it took him a good long time to return to the trails. He would always take a friend and preferred to go at busier times. He did report the incident to the park rangers, but nothing ever really came from it. I have recently ventured up the trails, just with friends to confirm that it's not somewhere you would want to be alone. I have an experience to share with you that happened to me and a group of my very close friends. But before I get into it, I'm going to give you a little bit of context. My name is Tom. I weigh about 160 pounds and stand at 5 foot 11. I'm 25 and love the outdoors so much that I actually started a club in high school called the Outdoor Grizzlies. It was a very small group of us who would set up different hiking trips to go on. We had hiked all the way to the beautiful Sleeping Giant State Park trails of Connecticut all the way to the Julia Pfeiffer Burns State Park in California, which has a fantastic 80-foot waterfall with a lavish scenery. In this group of my fellow friends are my best friend from middle school, Jake, my good friend I met in freshman year of high school, Jennifer, and Jake's girlfriend since high school, Christine. The four of us were inseparable, and we went on all of our hiking trips together in high school. We held fundraisers, and the school saw how much we loved nature, and that we could make a career out of it. So, they gladly allow us to take a step further. We were all in shape for the most part, which is why we loved doing what we did. 
Not only did it free our minds and give us clarity, but it took away some of the anxiety that you often experience as a teenager, as well as depression. Anyway, we at least didn't have to go through it very much. As I said, the hiking really helped deal with it. Even our teachers at some point went with us and said that it really helped manage their stress and anxiety too. But after graduating from high school, things sort of died down at the club. We all kept in touch and stuff, as most people in high school do, but life happens. The only one I really spoke to was Jake. He and Christine were still together, but I barely spoke about hiking because it just wasn't in our blood anymore. Jennifer did her own thing and was seeing a college jock called Robert. And with the exception of Jake, we all drifted for a few years. One evening in May, I decided it would be nice to throw a bonfire. Just a few close friends. Christine didn't really want to hang around people she didn't know, and she had the bright idea to invite Jennifer. Through the power of social media, it turns out Jennifer was actually very happy and willing to come. She spoke about how life got in the way of her and Robert, and how they broke up. The bonfire would be just what she needed so that we could all catch up and talk about life, and it would be like old times. She said her number was still the same and said to call her to confirm. It was easier than I thought. Suddenly I was filled with happiness and excitement. It was gonna be just like old times. When the bonfire happened, it went off without a hitch. We had a fantastic time. It was around 1.30 a.m. and everyone else had gone. The ones who were left were myself, Jake, Jennifer, and Christine. The cool spring breeze embraced my neck, and the fire kissed my nose, leaving me with goosebumps. Jake had mentioned how peaceful and nostalgic this was, as he downed the tail end of his beer. The energy in the group was so nice, and Jennifer mentioned how I once slipped on a wet rock trying to run away from an unusual bug, which we all nicknamed the Bug Incident. We all laughed, and Jake said that if only we could relive those days. Christine looked over at Jennifer and said, Maybe we can't go back, but can relive them. Then, a sudden idea crossed everyone's mind. See, we'd always spoken about going somewhere, somewhere exotic, and having a huge hike there. That was our dream years ago. But then, the spark of genius filled us all, and we formed a plan to go to Hawaii. Jake's aunt, fortunate for us, was a flight attendant, and I had a rainy day with a generous amount of money. And Jennifer saved money for a trip that she was going to take on her own, and Christine had a decent-sized YouTube following from her makeup channel, and she was sure whatever else she needed, she would crowdfund. After three weeks, we pulled our finances, and we were able to afford the trip. We were going to stay around the Honolulu area because there was a very well-known hiking place with a beautiful waterfall. We arrived to our destination and decided to be tourists for the first three days, leaving the last three to hike the area, and the seventh day to get ready to leave. We, however, wanted to take it a step further and wanted to camp out there too. We had done it many times, we were well versed in camping, so we felt like we could take this on no problem. We made our way deeper and deeper into the forest. We saw people along the way, tourists we spoke to, a few friendly locals, and then we began to notice how much more isolated it became. Christine had said that we seemed far away and didn't have any signal on our phones. She bought a compass and a map, so she said we should just find a place around the area that we were in, and we all agreed. We found a beautiful place, almost as if like it were waiting for us. It was on a cliffside looking over almost the entire island. It was at this point we realized just how far we'd hiked, and it was relatively safe. 
It was a fence made of bamboo, so you couldn't really fall unless you purposefully threw yourself over the fence. But even then, there was a big enough rock protruding out so that you wouldn't fall. It was the most magnificent view I'd ever seen. We set up the tent we had, and some lanterns around a fire to keep away the insects. Jennifer and Christine wanted to explore nearby to see if there was anything here, while Jake and I were setting everything up. When we hear the girls call out, Hey! We found a clearing and some bushes. Oh, and there are stairs. I thought they were joking. When we went over to look, we saw they were pretty worn, and they led to a piece of rock on the bottom. To put it into better perspective, if you imagine Pride Rock from The Lion King, we were standing on the flat piece, then imagine another flat piece on the bottom. But then there are stairs wrapping around to connect the two. Jennifer was against going down the worn steps because she was afraid that someone may get hurt. But we had to know what was down there. And Jake and I said that we would go while the girls stayed from their own choice. They were made of stone and were worn, but when we got to the middle, it wasn't actually that bad. We finally got down and saw that it was a piece of rock which we were standing on, on the upper level. It was like a cave underneath. We made our way in, and we could hear the footsteps of crushing broken coconut shells and sand grit as we walked. Jake took his flashlight and lit up the inside. We were amazed. There seemed to be drawings on the walls on what looked like a burial site. It looked disturbed, but the drawings had us intrigued. I lit my flashlight and pointed it to the wall. We were able to make out bodies and very tiny heads. The walls looked untouched. We carefully swept the debris from the wall. We needed more light to understand the carvings, and we called the girls to come down, who did so with reluctance. We asked them to light their flashlights and point at the wall. We all did the same and they were amazed. We took pictures, and agreed to inform the information desk of this place when we were leaving. Maybe we had discovered something that had been forgotten to time. Then Christine said that the carvings told a sequence of events from right to left. As we looked, it just looked like a figure being pushed off a ledge. It was at this point that we got chills, and decided to head back up. Jake broke the silence and said that, remember, the carvings are probably from thousands of years ago. It was just history. But we agreed that it was still creepy, and that if it were to rain, we would seek refuge in the cave. But that would be a last resort. We opted to go look around not too far from the campsite, but just exploring. We were all inspired since we stumbled across the carvings on the wall, that perhaps we would be fortunate enough to find something else. We were about 15 minutes into the walk when we realized the sun was beginning to set, and Christine said that we should probably head back, that we didn't want to get caught out in the dark, as it would obviously make things harder for us while trying to get back to the camp. As we were heading back, we heard rustling and sticks breaking. Christine grabbed Jake, and Jennifer locked arms with mine. We thought it was an animal, and braced ourselves in the defensive just in case, when suddenly the large leaves parted, and what appeared to be a native Hawaiian man with a straw hat and a touristy-looking shirt emerged from the bushes. He asked why we were here. We explained we were hikers, and that we have a campsite not too far from the rock, and told him about the strange carvings we saw on the wall. His eyes widened, and they felt like they pierced our very souls. He said he would give us a little bit of advice, and the advice consisted of pack up and leave, that bad things happen here, and that a curse had been placed on the area, and that we should go. We all asked why. The man stared at us before saying, The night marches. 
He then said that Bo approaches and to get somewhere safe and to never look at them in the eye. With that final cryptic message, he went off. We all looked at one another. Jake said, did we really come all this way to leave? We decided it was only going to be one night and dusk was approaching soon as the morning comes and we'll just pack and leave. We didn't want to touch anything. So we made our way back to the campsite and when we finally got back, Jennifer remembered that she bought a pot and two cans of clam chowder with pita bread. We lit the fire and enjoyed a reasonable dinner. It was one of the best nights we had since our high school days. Christine looked at her watch and noticed it was a quarter to 1am. I'll never forget the time because it was the night from hell. We decided to get ourselves ready to sleep. Two people could fit in one tent and since it was so beautiful outside, Jennifer and I opted to admire the stars and lay out and fall asleep under them. I remember thinking to myself, I only see skies like this on wallpaper for my computer. It was so magical I dozed off. I remember waking up to use the bathroom. There was really no bathroom, so I decided to go into the woods. It was silent. There were no animals making noises, no insects, nothing. It was eerie quiet. It was as if time had stopped. I quietly walked behind the tent into some bushes to release, when suddenly I heard a horn. I'm not sure what it was, but it sounded like a horn. I just passed it off as me hallucinating and headed back to sleep. Suddenly as I was drifting off, I heard what sounded like a drum. My finger tapped the ground to the beat of the drum as it began to get louder. Jake awoke and peeked outside the tent and looked at me. How do you have service, man? Turn it down. I told Jake it wasn't me. Now if you knew Jake, he could be very serious and would only call me by my full name in these situations. Thomas, stop joking around and go to bed, yeah? You know we've got to get up early. He rubbed his eyes looking at his Apple Watch. Suddenly a horn noise went off again, this time louder. Jennifer sat up. Suddenly, the drum was even closer. Christine was still fast asleep. That's when it dawned on us that the sounds were coming from all around us and we felt cornered as they got closer. We were frozen and we made a plan to leave. Jake went back into the tent and you could hear him whisper to Christine. I was trying to gather our things and I motioned to Jennifer to grab her bag but she was just staring behind me. I had a sickening feeling in the pit of my stomach. I turned around to look, while I could hear Jake gathering his things in the tent. My fight or flight kicked in as my head slowly turned. That is when I saw a man standing in at least six foot tall with a machete. But that wasn't the frightening part. It was his head. It was very small. He had what appeared to be a coconut for a head. Or at least it was covering what was his head and it was no bigger than a coconut. We were all frozen in fear. I immediately pushed Jennifer away from looking at the monster and she snapped out of it, grabbed me and we ran with Jake and Christine following. We had no idea in which direction we were going, we simply ran. We left all our possessions and heard footsteps and branches breaking like there were at least 10 or more of them chasing after us. I don't know how we got through the forest. Christine noticed a strong river of water and figured that we could lose them if we crossed. We all jumped and began making our way through, but it kept getting deeper. And before we knew it, the river had overpowered us and carried us away. We looked back and saw five of them at the river bank with various weapons in their hand. They were no longer following us, simply staring. That moment will be etched into my head for as long as I live. The look of them at the riverbank as we were slowly departing. I don't think I'll ever forget the beings with average height but small heads. 
and I ended up passing out. I woke up with the sun in my face and Christine hitting me. She had a gash on her head and Jake and the rest of us were covered in scratches and bruises. Before we could even talk, we heard a helicopter over our heads. They airlifted us to the island nursing triage to get checked out. I asked them how they found us. Apparently an Apple Watch ping sent the coordinates at 4.55 and they'd been searching for us for four hours. Christine just cried and Jennifer hugged her. Jake and I looked at one another. The guy added that we should never have been there anyway. The local authorities came to speak with us and asked what happened and we told them about the drawings and the men with the small heads. They went on to explain it was just folklore, but people get so frightened with the night marchers that they end their lives because their minds can't take what they see. They had only two instances of documented suicides, one from a 19-year-old girl who jumped off the rock cliff that we were camping at, and the other person they called off the search for because authorities refused to search when night approaches. The area was closed off to the public when they found four headless bodies in the 1980s, and perpetrators were never found. He continued that we must have been way off the trail to be at that rocky area because it's completely closed off. They seemed puzzled with how we even got there to begin with. I had chills running down my spine. What the hell did we see? Was it even a head at all? How could they have breathed or seen anything with the coconut covering them. I asked if the night marchers have heads. He said, since we're alive to tell the tale, they didn't remove their coconut shell. But had we died and jumped off the cliff like the young girl, we would have apparently known the answer. After this, we decided to take a very long break from hiking or camping and just met up at a bar. The four of us don't really talk about this anymore. I'm sure it's to no one's surprise. It almost ended our friendship. But I'm glad now that after four years, we can sort of move past it. I am a local to the South Jersey area, Pine Barrens and all. I hunt and fish on the regular, and my house is in the woods. I'm used to the sounds and things that regularly happen around New Jersey. I've had two experiences that I could never grasp an explanation for that still give me chills. The first one? It was a cold six-day firearm season, and it was opening day. I had set my stand up in a new spot a little bit further than my previous year. I'm following my bright eyes, reflectors, to get to my stand and it's pitch black and cold. I'm saying minus four with the wind. Not common in New Jersey so it's already eerie as I'm walking through the pines and I get about 25 yards from my tree when I stop to light a cigarette before I go up. As I'm standing there a mile deep in the pine barrens alone in the dark, I hear a grunt. Not a deer grunt, a full-blown snarl. It stops and goes on for a minute or two. At this point, my shotgun is stacked to the rim and I'm looking towards the noise. It charges me, gets about 10 yards out, and I shot once, hitting to the left of it. This sent it off into the darkness. So I figured, get in your tree now. So I booked it. I was about 10 yards away from my tree, and I get charged again, this time from the back, thrusting me to the ground. I went face down in delusion. Whatever it was had hit me and kept going. I stayed in my tree until 10 a.m. when it was bright out. My only description of the thing would be a hog mixed with a goat. It was terrifying. And by the way, we don't have any wild boar here. Now for the second story. I fish the Great Egg Harbor River regularly, especially striper fishing, which just so happens to land in the fall, which is cold. I walk a trail that used to go to an old shipbuilder's manufacturer on the river. I fish the old structure. Bass loved the structure. However, there is still a remaining building that's standing. Not bad until you go in. So one day, me and a friend of mine are going to catch the outgoing tide. We load the truck, 
drove to the trail and hiked about a mile. We get down and set up. The conditions are perfect. However, about an hour in, the rain came. And when it comes, we knew it was going to pour. So we packed our stuff and headed for the building. Once inside, we set our stuff down and figured, screw it, let's just chill for a bit and explore the rooms. Bad idea. It gets creepy in the storm. So we walk up to the second floor where there was a line of rooms on the right and a balcony on the left overlooking the building. As we approached the first door, my friend regretted it. He didn't want to go in anymore and immediately turned around with a big nope. I like exploring, so I kept on going. I checked the first room to find nothing spectacular and kept walking, checking the rooms one by one. And I get to the second to last one and I got this weird sensation in my body almost like I'd received the worst news of my life. I broke down. Once I got it together, I boogied downstairs where I found that my friend had left and already headed for the truck, leaving all of his fishing equipment. So I grabbed everything and ran out, but I had to run back to grab my rod holder that I was using as a bum defense. As I looked at the second story window, I saw a child standing there it was the scariest moment of my life, and I will never go fishing there again. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's adventures in the woods. I certainly did. A really strong collection of stories. Thank you all for joining me. If you liked today's stories, you can feel free to let me know. You know what to do. And also, what did you guys think of the Coconut Head people, the Night Marchers? I'd never heard of them before. I actually had to Google them and look them up when I finished reading the story, as I found them fascinating. Um, but I'd love to hear what you guys think down in the comments. Do you believe in them? Do you think that they're, you know, they were hallucinating? Just give me your thoughts. I'd love to read about this. Let's have a let's have a conversation in the comments section. I know a lot of you have been asking for Deepwood stories, so I hope these were up to scratch. I certainly think they were, and that Mort delivered. <laughs> I'd like to, as always, extend a huge thank you to my members, patrons, and supporters over at Coffee for your continued help and support. And I would also like to remind everyone that you can download our app for free, and you get lots of free stories, and uh, it's just really cool to listen to, and you can customize it with sound effects and stuff. So yeah, that'd be pretty sweet. And if you're still here at the end, well done. Why not listen to another video by me? The links are on screen now, so you can check out one of these. For now, though, I'm going to sign off. So stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.